Morning. And welcome to church. And this Sunday we get to be reminded of God's great love for us and how he has made us his own children and will watch over and will protect us throughout our lives. We're going to follow the order of service found in the bulletin. And for that, we'll begin with the opening hymn 436. We'll continue with that responsive reading. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In you I trust my God. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you are good, O Lord. We confess to our refuge all our sins. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me and am deeply sorry for them. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. And we'll join in praying. O oh Lord, spare us from the folly of wickedness and the pursuit of evil. Make us rejoice in your saving acts, that we who have been redeemed by your Son may abound in works of faith, hope, and love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And reading from Ezekiel chapter 18, we're going to see that the Lord's way is fair. You reap what you sow. The wicked, they will die. Those who trust in Christ will live. You reap what you sow. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean, you who keep repeating this proverb concerning the soil of Israel? Fathers eat sour grapes and their son's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Lord God, you will never again use this proverb in Israel. Indeed, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father is mine, just like the soul of the Son. The soul who sins is the one who will die. But you say, the Lord's way is not fair. Listen now, house of Israel. Is it my way that is not fair? Is it not your ways that are not fair. If a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and practices unrighteousness, he will die because of it. Because of the unrighteousness that he has practiced, he will die. But if a wicked man turns from his wickedness that he has done and practices justice and righteousness, he will preserve his life. Because he has seen and turned away from all the rebellious acts that he had committed, he will surely live, and he will not die. 
But the house of Israel says, The Lord's way is not fair. Is it really my ways that are not fair, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not fair? Therefore, I will judge each one of you according to his ways, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your rebellious acts, so that you will not set out a stumbling block that makes you guilty. Throw off from yourselves all your rebellious actions by which you have rebelled, and obtain a new heart in a new spirit for yourselves. Why should you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. So repent and live. That is God's word. We'll continue with him 304. Our second reading from Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself gives us that hard task, following the attitude of Christ and living in harmony with one another. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and having one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility consider one another better than yourselves. Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the word of God. Please stand. Our gospel lesson for this morning is from Matthew 21. May what we confess be seen in what we do. That's what our Savior teaches us here. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not. But later, he changed his mind and went. He came to the second and said the same thing. <clears throat> the second son answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Amen. I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. However, the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Even when you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe him. That is the word of Jesus. We'll continue with the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And we'll continue with the next hymn. What can destroy a family? Same thing that can destroy a nation. A lack of unity. A lack of harmony. And one of the ways that this lack of unity and harmony can come about inside a, a family is by sinful pride and arrogance. That thinking that your opinion is gospel truth and everyone else's opinions and everybody else's thinking is wrong needs to be corrected. That sinful arrogance and pride it can divide even the tightest and most loving, caring families. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've even experienced inside your lives the hurt and hard feelings that come about from that pride and arrogance, that lack of unity. That which can rip apart a family or that which can rip apart a, a nation, the Apostle Paul, the Lord through the Apostle Paul is concerned about happening inside the church of God. Division. Lack of unity. Lack of harmony. That's why the Apostle Paul, in a very many of his letters, deals with divisions that can pop up inside of God's church because when brothers and sisters fight inside God's church, the results are often very bad. So in the first four verses of our reading from Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul lays out Live in harmony. Have unity so that no divisions may come into the church and destroy not your church people in Philippians, but God's church. And he lays out how that unity can be achieved. Philippians chapter 2. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and having one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit but in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. 
Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself by the taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How do you and I achieve this unity? How do you and I achieve harmony here at God's church in St. Paul's Xonia? The Lord tells us how. By setting aside that sinful pride and arrogance and following the attitude of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who is the boss. Jesus Christ who causes the earth to spin around the sun. Jesus Christ who is waited on by angels. Jesus Christ who gives the food and water you drink and eat the ability to nourish and sustain you. Jesus Christ who brings the change of the seasons. Who created all things. Jesus Christ submitted himself. humbled himself to his creation. In our verses it says, he emptied himself. He set aside all that awesome power and might, put it aside not to be seen so that he could live among the creatures he made and so that while living among the creatures he would be submissive to their rules and their edicts To the point of death. Make no mistake, Jesus could have told Pontius Pilate, hit the road, Jack. He could have had the Pharisees kiss his feet. But what did he do? Submitted himself to their judgments so that he could serve you. By bringing you salvation. And that is the attitude that humble, selfless attitude that Jesus says you're to have. Follow his example. And what a challenge that is for you and for me to follow that humble attitude that Jesus Christ has so clearly laid out for us in the life he lived here in this world because very often, not always, but very often you and I, we like to be right. We like to be the ones that everyone comes to for guidance and counsel because we want to tell them this is what you're to do and it's the best course of action. Because I know what's best. And maybe you've seen that in your home, the kind of, no, dear, we're going to do it my way because I know right. Maybe you've seen that at work. Maybe it wasn't you doing it at work. Maybe it was someone else. That selfish, arrogant attitude of my way is the right way. That lack of humility. As the Apostle Paul warns us about, it can even come up into God's church. Maybe the church is wondering, what is our next course of action? 
What is the ministry that we are going to pick up and, and pour our time and effort into? And you have an idea. You have an idea on a direction the church should take. You have an idea on the direction of ministries that we should focus our time and efforts on. And so you get to work. You put in a lot of time. You put in a lot of effort to come up with this great and wonderful plan. You get support, and you lay out your reasons why. Here's why this is the action we should take. Here's why this is the ministry we should do. And then what happens? Your plan isn't picked up, but a different course of action, a different ministry is pursued. All your time, all your effort, maybe even some of your hard-earned dollars, though appreciated, was not followed. How do you react? Do you take up this attitude of Christ? Do you humbly submit to the plan that was not yours? Do you say, guys, how can I help to make this ministry, this course of action, a success? It wasn't my idea, but that's okay. Because we are united in this church, in God's family, and let's work together to do our best. Do you have that attitude of Christ? Perhaps. But I bet on rare occasions here, our attitude hasn't been one of submission. Let's go. But when your plan isn't picked up, when your idea for a ministry isn't chosen, the shock happens. A little bit of anger. Do you guys know what you're doing? Look at how I laid it out. This makes the most sense. What can happen? You hold on to that grudge. They didn't choose my way. I'm not going to help with that. There's not a humble, loving attitude like Jesus tells us to have. Instead, there is grudge. There's this arrogance. There's this pride. And it leads to that division. God's own children, brothers and sisters in Christ, fighting and bickering and not being united. The church starting to divide. It's hard. It's hard to have this attitude of Christ. Humbly submitting ourselves to others. But what is it? Sinful arrogance and pride rearing its ugly head and divisions that are being caused. You know what that is? It's a very simple word. It's it's sin. grudge holding. It's a sin for which the Lord says you need to repent. Because that simple sin of breaking up the unity, the harmony inside not your church, but God's church, will bring not God's pleasure to you, but His anger. And his wrath. The humble attitude of Christ. That's what we're to have. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he is by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant, 
When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first thing we need to do is just admire that great love of Christ. The fact that he was willing to submit himself, humble himself. What did he pray the night that he was to be arrested and tried? <coughs> Excuse me. What did he pray? Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus Christ knew what was coming. He knew those soldiers were going to come. He knew he was about to be beaten and bloodied. He knew he was about to be found guilty by some human beings that he made and were uh, following bad advice. He knew the nails were coming. He knew that suffering in hell was coming. He knew that death was coming. But what did he say? Not my will. Your will. He got up, scolded the disciples. Come on, let's go. It's time to die. Why? Because through his humble submission to that saving will of God, peace between you, me, harmony was made between us and our righteous judge. He bled. He died in your place. He sacrificed himself so that when you hold on to those grudges, so when you act in selfish pride and arrogance, when you, by your actions and words, are not promoting unity and harmony in the church, but seeking to form two fists to collide against each other, Jesus says, no. I forgave that sin. His blood has done away with your trespasses, purified you, and made you clean. That's the beautiful act of love that Jesus Christ carried out for you. And now comes the challenge. He says, have my attitude. Self-sacrificing attitude. Looking out for others. Submitting to others. May the good Lord Jesus Christ himself give us the strength and ability to do that. Amen. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for your opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Jesus Christ, Lord of the Church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us, in the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost. Help us to see your face, O Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Holy Spirit, giver of life, through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend who does not believe in you, or whose faith is weak or troubled. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, to grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and others, so that we may so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Amen. 
And now receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and always give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. And we'll close with the last hymn. Good morning to you all. Thank you so much for coming. Just a, a few quick things. I was asked to, to share some of the, the ways that we do our services. So the responsive reading is actually taken from the psalm of the day. All I do is just take that and I just have you speak and me speak. So we're still getting the psalm of the day. Um, we don't always have the Lord's Prayer. We don't always do the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed. And the reason for that is, is simply we're trying to honor that 40 a minute service time that we imposed on ourselves and, and we would be unable to do all the normal prayers uh, and, and keep it to that 40 minute time frame. And, and one of the reasons why I'm standing here instead of there, there's two of them. One, higher up, you project spit farther and I do, I do let stuff fly once in a while. So this puts me a little farther back from y'all and also for the, the filming, we need these lights to be uh, doing hard work to make me look good. So uh, that, is, that is the reason why we're doing some of this stuff in our services. If you ever have any questions, just, just let me know. And we'll do our best. Have a wonderful day.